Okay, so we're talking about the kingdom of God, and as we begin, let's have a word of prayer. We're grateful for the kingdom, Father, and your invention and your design that pervades all of existence. Everything belongs to you. Everything is due to you. You're a creator. You are brilliant beyond our imaginations. We thank you for what we see in this, this physical world. But we're thankful for the spiritual work that you've done, that you have invented and made happen. Thank you for our King Jesus, and uh, thank you for the possibility to have fellowship with Jesus, the Spirit, and you to live with you. We thank you for the kingdom message, and Father, we pray that you will help us in all things to submit to your ways regarding your design and help us to realize its superiority. Help us to be careful with what we do as we think about changing designs. May we never do that. Help our world, Father, to recognize the need to stick with your truth and to realize that your ways are the best. Thank you for loving us, giving us your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the kingdom of God, and we're coming, just uh, coming out of our class on Wednesday night, talking about the assembly. Oh, there's the crew. Good to see the crew walking in. It's been a troublesome week this week. <laughs> there's David with Good to, good to see you, David. I won't ask you to salute or wave or anything. It's just good to see you. All right. Some things just out of our, our class noise night, as we were talking about uh, the assembly, and then we also were kind of applying it to the heart and what it should mean to us. And it's, of course, we, we always hear the command aspect of it, but we want to remember that God has built the assembly to be something very special to us. And, and all of us should truly have a heart that wants to worship God. Um, Psalm 122.1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And, you know, I have been in situations where I, it, it was not enjoyable to go to assembly. Just maybe there were church problems or whatever. And, you know, you just really have to... to uh, examine yourself and get your thinking right and, and, you know, look at your heart. What's going on? You're coming into fellowship with God in a special fellowship. You're coming into fellowship with one another. Uh, we are a one unit today as we are with God, receiving our worship, participating in worship with us. And here we are in this great big unity. And this is a really beautiful thing. And uh, Psalm 35, 18, I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. And uh, let's not forget that what we're doing is wanting to praise God. And again, we get into sometimes the, the mentality that uh, I've checked off the boxes of what I'm supposed to do, as if I'm going to be saved by check boxes. You know, when we forget it's something that God is wanting in our heart. Obedience, of course, but obedience is something that, that, needs to just penetrate how beautiful, how wonderful it is to come to God, to give Him praise. And, and assembly is that opportunity to praise God. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all of those around Him, Psalm 89, 7. So we have this great need that sometimes we just have to kick ourselves a little bit, remind ourselves about what we're doing. And uh, all of that should, of course, hit our attitude. And uh, in fact, we can even think about improving the assembly. I didn't get to look at this Wednesday night. So, you know, here's something to think about as you're, you're thinking about assembly. Make a list of opportunities that are wasted when one does not assemble with the saints. And that's to bring, up, bring attention to the opportunities that you have to be here and to serve one another. Um, <clears throat> In view of the discussion so far, why and how should one uh, learn to come out of himself to bring glory to Jesus in, in the church? We could say in the assembly, but with the church, serving the church as well. And we realize that we are personalities that come together. And we, we know the beautiful pageant of all the different personalities. And you can go and look at your favorite uh, personality test and, and see the the, the different directions of personality. It's a, it's a challenge for personalities to, to, to really come together sometimes because of, of how far apart they are. We all offer something and we all can offer something that's not good. We can offer something good, something not good at the same time. We need to be people who offer something good. No matter what, we have to come out of ourselves, don't we? 
never use personality as an excuse. Here it is, we can grow beyond our personality, can't we? We can actually change our traits. Humility, how does that happen if it's not in your personality? Well, God expects us that we're going to grow our character. It doesn't matter what your personality is. We take on the character traits of God. And so we really have to think about, you know, in the church, I don't want to be a remote person. I don't want to be someone just kind of, uh, just kind of, you know, arm's length holding on and don't, don't talk to me or don't ask me to do anything or don't ask me to contribute because God is asking us to do something much more than that. We're, we need to come out of ourselves and to glorify God in, in what we do with one another and in the giving of our hearts and praise to God. And what can you do to anticipate and look forward to assembly? As you think of, uh, think of the assembly specifically re regarding the local church, uh, what did you think about this morning besides the clock, you know, and you got trying to get there and get dressed and get everything ready and don't want to be late. And I know that very well. I mean, I know that pressure, especially as a preacher, but you, you know, you know how that goes. And what can you do to, to properly anticipate the coming of assembly? And any questions, any answers there? What can you do to anticipate looking forward to the assembly? You can pray. Yeah, you can talk to God. And what would you pray about? Okay, everybody to be here? That would be a good one? Hear me? Receptive to the lesson, okay, to, to hear God. Open my heart to hear God. Uh, to see the beauties of the truth of God. How often do we take that for granted as Christians? Sitting here reading the scriptures and, and, you know, we're so blessed that we can even close our eyes and go to sleep and, and, you know, and be bored when we're listening to the word of God. What a blessing this is to hear the word of God. Okay, what else? Okay, what a, again, what a beautiful blessing to be encouraged in other people, to think that way. Now, critical people really have a problem with this. You know, that's nothing good about anything ever, right? But when you learn to think about the church and the blessing of what it is, we, we are fellow disciples. And yeah, brother so-and-so has a problem. Sister so-and-so has, has a problem over there, you know. But we realize that, that um, God, this is a glorious thing, and you know, we are with people who believe in Jesus Christ. And we're with people who are sacrificing their desires to follow Jesus Christ. And we're all in this together, aren't we? We have all chosen the most important thing in the world, and that is to follow God. And we need to take encouragement in that. And when we come to worship, well, what about some attitudes in worship? How can you anticipate assembly? Okay, can have a positive attitude. Uh, that's really, really important, isn't it, uh, about, uh, about coming. And, and, you know, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, man, I wonder how, lesson, how long the lesson is going to be today, you know. How much overtime is, is Denny going to preach? None of you have ever done that. I know that. And uh, all I hear is just, you know, just the hugs and the good stuff. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's just so easy to, to start to anticipate what you don't like in any situation, right? And we know what that's like. You're going to some event. Your wife is pulling you along or your husband is pulling you along. You don't really want to be there. It, we can kind of bring these critical attitudes towards, uh, towards the assembly into what we're doing. And we can be positive. Um, what else? What can you do in anticipating assembly? Okay, you can prepare your mind, get yourself ready. And that's a matter of prayer, isn't it? But, but it's a matter of focus. We always come back to 
what an amazing mind God has created that, that through focus we can actually adapt our mind to go up to what we focus upon. And we can learn to, to bring focus to light as being something glorious and something beautiful and something big if we'll put our mind there. And this is where we're going. Um, what does a church of the Lord need to do? It needs to give its whole heart to the Lord. It needs to be worshiping God, getting its heart ready. David, we just saw he was, he was ready to go to the house of the Lord. He was, he was thankful, you know, he was just so glad. And this really should be in all of us. And our attitude makes all the difference in the world. We really should be a, a, collection, a collection of people who love the Lord with our heart. We want to express that today. Um, what about contributing yourself? Anything about anticipating assembly with your own contribution? Well, I make a contribution every Sunday. I write out the check and put it in the box. You know, it's like, that's my contribution. What kind of contribution are we talking about? Okay, being ready to serve, and what would that look like? Teaching, teaching Bible classes, being involved. Okay, what else? Okay, being, uh, being observant of needs. Um, I mean, we see David sitting on a pillow right here, you know, and he's obviously hurting a little bit, uh, or about maybe a lot. And, hey, who's here today? Thank you, David. You know, you're showing a lot of faith, uh, being in a high level of pain and just sitting here, and we, we appreciate that. Um, okay, what else? Okay, being prepared and material. Of course, we, you know, you know me. My, my class does not always follow with questions exactly, but, uh, but I design the questions to think around the subject so that you will have familiarity with the subject. So I, I have a little bit different purpose in questions than a lot of people. But the idea of, of you know, getting yourself into the word, uh, trying to to follow the direction of uh, that's been provided to some degree or another. How else? What can you do to contribute? All right, uh, being filled with Jesus to, to want to share Jesus, you know, th this is just a big part of what we are, isn't it? That, that really, uh, it dovetails into, into our excitement with one another, I think. And uh, it, it affects what we are as a body when we are all minded this way and glorifying Jesus in, in what we're doing. Okay? What else would you contribute? How can you contribute? Okay, prepared to serve. How can you be, um, how can you initiate what you contribute? What are some things you can initiate as you're contributing in the local assembly? You're going to come to services. Today I'm going to initiate and I am going to do this. What would you say after that? What are you going to do that are very important? Reach out to someone like whom? Okay. Um, okay, someone that's not here. Very good. Visitors. Some that are not real in touch. Some that are, uh, how about some that have bad attitudes? Should you reach out to them? Who needs the most effort sometimes? Hey, sometimes you have to show yourself a friend to someone who never shows himself a friend, even as a brother in Christ. I've had people in churches who never once talked to me. Not one time came up to me to talk to me. Yeah, you know, so, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> you have to make an effort. You, you know, you, you give of yourself. You contribute yourself. That's what we're talking about, getting out of yourself. That's right. All right. And 
know, we're, we're thinking about everybody. We all need each other, don't we? And that, that's a continual thing. And we take for granted strong faith people, right? But what do strong faith people need? Other strong faith people. Encouragement. We, we need to be people who encourage. And, of course, the people I'm talking about are elders and deacons and the preacher and, and the strong women of the church, but not you, right? Is that who we're talking about? Who are we talking about? Every individual, if you're between uh, zero and 150 years old, then you are included in this. Okay, that, that's all of us, isn't it? It's contributing, contributing ourselves. And we really do have to get our, out of ourselves. We do have to be motivated by Christ. We have to do, it's not always, it's not always fun. I mean, we have people we really enjoy. And <clears throat> truthfully, who do many people often gravitate to when they come to assembly? the people they like to talk to the most. Who should we be gravitating to? Those that need us the most. And uh, so <clears throat> think about that. And, you know, you look around in the church, and they're, maybe they're not here, as Charlene was saying, that's reaching out to them. But <clears throat> we have to consider <clears throat> the local church as a better a matter of, of me making contribution. And... We remember in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16, that we have apostles and pastors and evangelists, and we have these teachers that, that equip us, but ultimately comes down to every, what? Supplying. Every member, every, every joint that is doing the work to, for the increase of the body. Okay, for a body to work well, what does every joint need to do? David, we are looking at David here. His body's not working well right now. Why not? Got something wrong with a joint in there somewhere? Um, you know, every joint. I mean, when the joints are not working well, and you've got, you know, this one working and this one's not working. I've only got nine joints not working, but the rest of my body's doing pretty good. Well, what does that look like? Um, but if all of your joints are working, then you get out there and you perform, and then, then you become something, and... This is true in the local church as well, and it's contribution, and it's everybody wanting to be. And of course, I'm talking to a Bible class, and usually you have your stronger members here at Bible class. Not to judge anybody who's not in Bible class, but um, I'm, you know, as they say, preaching to the choir. I don't really like that term very well, but but anyway, you guys know this is my point. But it's to be aware and always uh, trying to improve ourselves to become more than what we are, for the sake of the Lord. Because again, we God designed this local church, didn't He? And he wants us to be following his prescription, following his commands, uh, doing, doing the things that we should be doing, thinking about our attitudes, contributing ourselves, even when it's not much fun. And you think of Paul dealing with so many Christians, dealing with the Corinthians. Anybody remember how the Corinthians felt about Paul? You're not an apostle. You're not even sincere. These were charges against Paul. And then you read what Paul is doing in, to the church of Corinth, writing to the church of Corinth. And you read their love and, of course, the, the candor. And uh, he talks about the attitude of some of those that were saying these things. But we've got Paul that was contributing in every, everywhere he could, you know, among disciples, trying to build something to be better. This is, this is what we, we want to do. And it's not just to make a more fun local church. It's not just to make a warm and fuzzy local church. It's to produce a working unity collectivity with the Lord, functioning in the love of God, functioning in truth, performing, doing its responsibilities and love. In that, the body grows, and it becomes something that other people can see also, see the working of God. A congregation should always be Visible to others is having the working of God within it. God is here. And God has, has overhauled hearts to make them happen. So uh, just some things we have to be reminded of sometimes, right? Maybe I should stop here and bring this out some, you know, in the sermon a while ago. In a, in a, in a few minutes we're going to have. But anyway, so well, let's think about some things uh, as we go forward with the, the church, the organization of the local church. And these are things... Uh, 
I didn't mind kind of shortening this aspect because we all know these things, but part of our kingdom studies is the organization of the church. And we come down to really there's, there's one aspect of the organization of the local church or two aspects. Who's the head? Jesus Christ is the head. And in any given local church, if, if there's anybody who has something called authority, which is a very limited thing, but given by God, it, it is the elder. And we have, of course, three words for the, the elder, three concepts. The older person is the word elder. The shepherd or the pastor, the word pastor actually is referring to the elder because of what we see in the function. First Peter 5, he tells the elders, uh, shepherd the flock of God. And that, that is the function of, uh, of the elder. And we're all supposed to be shepherds. We've, we've, uh, we've had those sermons, etc. But then we have the idea of a bishop who, who is an overseer and someone who is in superintendence. And this is the definition of it. And so we have, we have a person that's not, you know, 22 years old. We have an experienced disciple, not a novice. He's been around. He knows discipleship. He knows uh, what is as he's been walking with Jesus. He is a shepherd that will, you know, big time. Here's the function one word for the function of what he does. Elder is the status of his age. Shepherd is his function. And that's why I really prefer the word shepherds to elder. But we're kind of stuck with the word elder. We just can't, I can't even get out of that habit. But I really like shepherd better because it's, it's a feeding aspect. And it's a nourishment wherein you are helping the, the flock to become stronger. You're protecting the flock you're doing whatever the flock needs. You are there to do that thing. And that's what a shepherd does. And so you have very strong disciples who are looking at those that are weak in their discipleship and then trying to help them to, on their journey to become stronger in following Jesus. And uh, so we have uh, elder, shepherd, and bishop. Uh, in this, we have some aspect, of course, of, uh, of an authority the warning was in 1 Peter 5, elders do not lord it over the flock. Don't sit there and make rules like you're God and then expect everybody to obey you because, you know, you're, you're the great rule maker. Uh, there are things that an elder might do in expediencies and directing people, but, but who's the lawmaker? Who's the one great lawmaker? That would be God. That would be Jesus. He is the chief shepherd. Okay, so... As we look at uh, the elder, we, we realize, of course, in the Scripture, there's a strong focus in this. In Acts 14, Paul is out preaching the gospel and converting people. The people that he's converting are, many of them are Jews. They've been around God for a long time. They're very mature individuals, and they become Christians. And he, on this journey, he appoints elders in every church. When people sometimes ask, how could that be? How could somebody become an elder when well, they just became a Christian? Well, again, they, they had been serving God. If you took all the things you know about the Old Testament, you know, about God, and you were living those things, and then you learn Jesus Christ, the most important essential thing of all, but if you have all that background of God, then you pretty well got the big picture, don't you, now that you have Jesus. So you understand how, uh, how this would happen. But Paul found it necessary on his journeys to appoint elders. This is how important it was to him, appointing elders. There were men who could serve. So Paul said, it's time to serve. You know? And we realize that uh, a church is going to function better when it has uh, elders and shepherds. First Peter 5, the elders who are among you, I exhort. I'm a fellow elder. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you as overseers. Again, not as lords, but... Uh, being examples to the flock. Uh, remember, remember, something has been entrusted to you that's very special. And make sure that you remember that the chief shepherd is watching. You know, the chief shepherd appears and he's, uh, he's the great auditor, right? You know, he's the, he's the great inspector. He's the great overseer. He knows what, what the, the middle management is doing. I, I know that doesn't exactly fit. But he knows what the elder is. And, of course, the elder, the shepherd is going to have to function properly. And now, I've known too many elders that were elders in age, but they did not know how to shepherd. And uh, the importance then of this passage that 
an elder be someone who is overseeing, he's, he's observing, he's seeing, he's watching uh, what needs to be cared for, and then feeding the flock, nourishing them wherever, wherever he can. Uh, There's a very important structure, very important function, of course. Uh, we have been the, through the qualifications, of course, and remember in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, uh, if a man desires the position of a bishop, and I remember the old the old statement, the first qualification of an elder is <laughs> he desires the work. Well, that can be looked at from different perspectives. And, uh, you know, some, some might say, I really don't want to mop the floor. And someone might say, well, I desire to mop the floor. Why would anybody desire to mop the floor? Huh? It's going to be clean when you're done. I mean, there's different ways to look at desire, right? It might not be always an enjoyable job, uh, but you know that it needs to be done, and you desire the, the end product of doing this thing. And so, yeah, you can have a desire for that, though you might not just say, I'm, I'm just really anxious to get into, you know, everything that an elder is going to face. But still, you, know, you can look at desire from these different perspectives. So the desire... He must be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission. For if man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a novice. Why? Yes. He needs to be experienced because what's the danger? Okay, lest he be puffed up with pride and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Which gives us an insight into the satanic, right? What went on with the devil? He was filled with pride. We see it in Matthew 4 when he tells the Son of God, fall down and worship me. I mean, what is that? How much more ultimate pride could you have than telling God, to fall down and worship you. I mean, that's as upside down. There's nothing more upside down than that. And so having a good testimony. So we, we see the life of the elder. And of course, we've talked about the fact that some people might not be married or have children. But really, what do all of these qualities reflect? Good stewardship? Okay, of what? Of his own life? Yeah. Uh, they reflect the Christian qualities, right? They reflect God. And really, an elder is only a disciple with uh, some, some additional things. He's gone forth in his maturity, and he has honed these, these qualities of God in his, in his life. But every disciple needs to do this, right? And that's why, you know, can you have a, a woman as wise as, as this older man who's an elder? Yeah. You think an elder ought to, and a multitude of counselors there is wisdom, you think an elder ought to ever bring a, an older lady, you know, this very mature woman, uh, go, go and talk to her and to get her ideas about some things? Do you think that'd be a good thing? Sure. You now, that, that's, that's nothing against his authority, right? Is it at all, right? And so we, we have this, uh, this spirituality that, that should be in all of us, uh, the elder, these qualifications are very, very important. We turn our attention, by the way, if this is done correctly, Hebrews 13, we are to, to do what we should have so the elder can have what? Anybody remember in his function? So he can have joy. See, the flock determines whether he does this with joy or not. And uh, when the flock is full of upheaval and the flock is full of pride, then uh, the elder takes tums. You know, he, he deals with life. Life is really, really hard. Uh, but when he does this properly, the church does it properly, then he, he has joy in this. He's doing the things of Jesus. We should always behave as a group of people that would bring joy to our shepherds. And that dovetails then into how you might even discuss issues with elders, right? I know of people who have been extremely upset and angry with, with elders. That's what came across. 
well, how about if we keep this on a love basis? You know, and you need to know this, and I lovingly come to you. If we, we talk about these things, you, we, this, is what, this is what the church life is supposed to be as far as God is concerned. So we have the deacon, and I hesitate. To, when we're talking about the organization of the, of the church, um, of course, the, the deacon does not have an authoritative position, and so do you put him in here or not? But he is an assigned servant, and so we'll talk about him from the standpoint of the, of the structure that we're looking at. But the, serve, the idea of serving is just the idea of being a servant, like a waiter at a table. Okay, so uh, you go out to the restaurant, and somebody's there, you know, can I take your order? And what's their sole responsibility while you're there at the restaurant? To serve you, get you your food, and please you, you know. And um, when it's done, there's, if, if they have good standing, which is in the deaconhood here, uh, what do you give them if they have good standing? You might give them a dollar you know, or five dollars or, or whatever it is. Okay, so here is the deacon that, that is to serve well, uh, and, but that's what he is all about. He's an attendant, a servant. Deacons like, must likewise, like the elder, have a certain lifestyle. If they're going to be recognized as deacon, now we're all supposed to be servants, but here's someone who's recognized as a servant by having reached a certain maturity level in Jesus. Okay, there's, there are those that want to deny any kind of deaconship and just say we're all, we're all deacons. But that's not, that's not so. The deacon must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. That's a huge statement right there, isn't it? A pure conscience in holding the revelation of God, the, the, the doctrines, the teachings, and the truth of God. He follows these things with a pure conscience. Let these first be tested. And again, just like the elder, uh, some experience level there. Where is this guy? Let them serve as, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. And their wives also must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. And for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we see a uh, we see a certain kind of life of the deacon. If, I'm obviously, if you're talking about serving the Lord, what should a person's life look like in serving the Lord? What does a servant's life look like who's serving Jesus as he's serving others? His life is going to be about living like Jesus, right? A deacon is to live like Jesus, think like Jesus. And this is what, uh, this is what his existence is, is all about, and he's going to practice that in the church. Now, Acts 6 is not necessarily deacons, but it is your, what is typical, and it's often used as, as what a deacon would do, because it's an act of service, and it's a utilitarian act of service, where there's a dis distinction between what the elders want to accomplish, what the deacons want to accomplish. And it's uh, at that point when uh, there were many disciples, and there was a complaint against the Hebrews, uh, by those of Greek persuasion, because their widows are Greek background, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay, so one of these interesting things that cultural background, for some reason, why why is this cultural background of people not being taken care of as well as this one over here? That's kind of a human thing, isn't it? You know, we, for whatever reasons might have existed, that was the situation. And the twelve, some of the multitude of the disciples said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So did the, did the, uh, the apostles see themselves? I said elders a while ago about an apostle. Did the, the apostles see themselves in an elevated function that was above serving tables? Yeah, they did. What were they doing? Teaching the word of God. Now, do you think that they ever served tables? Is that the point? Do you think there's anything the apostles would not have done for somebody else? But if there's somebody else that could do the, those utilities, what are they free to do? They're free to do the more important things. Okay, so they chose then seven men of good reputation, full of Holy Spirit and wisdom, appointed over this business, and uh, the apostles would give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word. 
And so it pleased the multitude. They chose Stephen and Philip and, and uh, Prochorus and, and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas. And these individuals then uh, went to do this, this utilitarian work. Now, by the way, does, the, does the, the deacon's work have to be only a utilitarian work? What might be the deacon's work? What does it all depend on? His what? The need and his gifts. Have you seen deacons with different gifts? I've seen deacons that really, they didn't do a whole lot except, except these kinds of utilitarian things. Maybe they, they ter- took care of the church building. They were like, you know, really good at maintenance and, and, some, and something like that. And then there were other deacons that, that you could put into Bible studies or you could put uh, over the, uh, the teaching structure of the church and, and they could, you know, facilitate all of this and, and they could understand, you know, the curriculum and, and where the curriculum needed to go. And, and uh, some deacons that were, were good at teaching, teaching. So what can a deacon do? He can do anything in the world, you know, practically uh, as he comes to serve. And that might be utilitarian, or it might be something that's you know, deeply functional from a spiritual level. Uh, but a deacon can be, someone can be a servant according to whatever his abilities might be. Okay? And we appreciate all deacons because it's someone who says, I've got a job to do, and I'm going I'm to do it faithfully. I'm going to do it with a strong sense of responsibility and do it right, whatever my job is. Okay? So we, uh, we see then the serving mentality, and these were, of course, not, these, these men were just highly reputable, uh, good men, wise and mature in Jesus Christ, full of the Holy Spirit. You know, these were highly functional men who themselves were going to go serve tables. That was the need of the moment, and that's what a servant does. He's going to look at the need of the moment, and he's going to go for it. Okay, so then we come to, to the evangelist. Again, I'm talking about, you know, the structure of the church. The evangelist really is not in the, in the structure of the church as far as a, a hierarchy of authority is concerned. But, but he is mentioned, of course, in the scriptures, and he's mentioned in connection with the church. And the idea of an evangelist is the proclaimer of good news of redemption through Jesus. Now, we tend to think of only an evangelist, evangelism as being out in the world. Evangelist teaches out there to non-Christians. But that actually is not true. And we're going to find that actually an evangelist has a function within the church as a proclaimer of good news. Okay, so that's the basic idea. He is uh, someone who tells about the redemption of Jesus. You know, we're continuing to do that. His life is mentioned in 1 Timothy 4. Let no one despise your youth, Paul tells Timothy, because he was only about 40 years old, probably. You know. <laughs> um, he might not quite have been that old yet, but uh, uh, youth was something that went into a much older person than today. You know, today we say, he's 22, he's not young anymore. Well, us older people know he's still young, but, uh, you know, when do you use your, lose your youth? Uh, well, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, for some, it's 40. For some, maybe it's 70. I don't know. But uh, anyway, let no one despise your youth. In other words, act mature. Be mature. Uh, be an example to believers in conduct and love and spirit, faith and purity. Give attention to reading and exhortation and doctrine. Don't neglect the gift that's in you that was given to you by the laying on of hands of the, of the, of, uh, the presbytery eldership. Uh, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress that might be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine and continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So we, we have an expected lifestyle, right? An expected direction of, of any evangelist. Uh, it's expected that he's going to be sincere. He's going to, uh, to walk in love. He's going to walk in spirit, walk in faith, walk in purity. Uh, his conduct is going to show Christ. And of course, we come back to the elder and the deacon, how... How perfectly does anybody do this? You know, I can tell you that nobody does it perfectly because I don't do it perfectly. You know, we're, we realize we're, we're just, we're, we're walking in Jesus and we're walking the struggle 
trying to do whatever we can for Jesus, but, but sometimes, we, uh, sometimes we sin, sometimes we're not quite what we need to, to be, but here's the direction that he's talking about. The direction of life is right here, like for the elder, for the deacon, and for the evangelist. And he's mentioned in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, God gave gifts to the church. That's the previous text. Uh, the gifts that Jesus gave when he, when he went to heaven were these teachers. If you want to go by text and context, Many people come to that, and he gave gifts unto men, and they, they start preaching a sermon about all kinds of gifts. The gifts in the text are the teachers that God has given to the church. What would the church be without teachers? Can you imagine no teachers? Teachers are, are an amazing gift to us. Uh, they direct our lives. They, they fill us. They, they give us the, uh, the foundation of how to operate among our, our lives. And he says, this is all for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body, until we all come to the unity and knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, till we all come to this mature, complete aspect here of living in God, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we won't just continue to be little kids. The idea is don't be a baby all of your life. Grow up. <laughs> it's time not to be mature, immature and just... Act like this little kid that kicks things when he's not happy. Uh, teachers are there to help us to grow and mature and not to be carried about by every false promise and, and any teacher coming along teaching whatever he might teach. But speaking truth and love, here's, here's, he's teaching the church, prophets, elders, teachers, teaching the church that we might all be speaking truth and love and grow up on all things into Jesus and uh, from whom the whole body then joined and knit together by what every joint supplies can help every part by doing its share for the body to, to grow. So here's here are teachers trying to make things happen uh, so that everybody will contribute what they do to the body so the body will be what God wants it to be. And so that's the evangelist. Um, uh, Paul told Titus, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. There's, there's Titus as evangelist with this important responsibility in the church. You know, evangelists have an in-church responsibility. You know, if, if, if that's where they're directed, if they're not out there in the mission world, then they have this responsibility uh, in the church. So we remember that Jesus is chief, of course, of all things. Ephesians 1, he's the head of the church. And... Uh, when the chief shepherd appears, Paul tells the elders, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. We always come back to the chief shepherd who's, re who's ruling us, who's leading us. It is always Jesus Christ. And if somewhere along the line we're following Jesus and we find that the earthly fellowship or, the, uh, of, or leadership of the elders is going the wrong direction, who is it that we follow? We follow our chief shepherd first, don't we, in all things. We always follow the chief shepherd. All right. Uh, well, oh, well, I'll have to come back to this. That was just a little minute's worth anyway. So anyway, I appreciate your attention, and uh, we'll pick up things on Wednesday night. Thank you.